Uh, there'll be no equations of any kind. Everything's done with pictures and hand waving. Um, so uh, Peter Gill has brought up the concept that maybe attention could be paid to interpretation of challenging DNA evidence. And John Buckleton has suggested uh, maybe continuous DNA as opposed to thresholds would be interesting. So this is an exercise in seeing how that works. OK, so the case um, uh, that was provided to Selmark was a handgun. And on that handgun, swathings were taken from four different locations, uh, from the base of the gun, from the back, the trigger, and from the top of the gun. And when it got the swabs got to the lab, amplifications of each swabbing were done in duplicate. I'm going to walk through this and use these pictures as labels. Uh, the reason they're called 3, 4, 5, and 6 is because that's the last number of the case, the item ID th throughout. So for consistency, those are the numbers. And the two colors, uh, green and blue, just show the two amplifications of each swab. Okay? So there are eight amplifications done all together. This is what the data looks like. Uh, the pictures that you're seeing are all taken from the True Allele Viewer interface. So here we have, for the base of the gun, here are two amplifications. Here's the STM Plus profile that was done. Uh, and then similarly for uh, swabbing four, here are the two amplifications. So altogether, there are eight amplifications. Uh, it takes, it's, it's good to get a close-up. So we're going to zoom in on uh, Locus D18. And throughout the talk, uh, we're, we're going to focus on it, just it's nice, clean mixture data. So what do we see in the data? Uh, well, for the base of the gun, we see two EPGs that look roughly similar to each other, but there's some difference in the peak variation. Uh, now, when we move to a different template from a different swabbing, we again see two amplifications that are sort of similar to each other, but they're somewhat different from the base of the gun, from three. And if, as we can continue down, we're seeing that the duplicate variation, say for a swabbing five, is capturing some of the peak variation. Uh, but the different, each template, each pair, is different from every other pair because they're four different templates. And that will become important in the interpretation as we go. OK. So human review was done. and. What I'm showing in the three uh, solid squares is when a full uh, allele pair was produced. In the, for the two loci where there are dotted lines, one allele and a wild card, an F as they do in England, uh, was produced. And when a statistic was computed uh, using uh, inclusion on this threshold-based method, the CPI, which, as you know, is a likelihood ratio, just with a particularly weak like, um, likelihood function, was 17,000. Well, the likelihood ratio is a great way of expressing ratios of probabilities. It's also interesting that the logarithm of the likelihood ratio, the, you can think of it as the order of magnitude or the number of zeros after uh, the first digit, is a standard measure of information in much of science and statistics and computer science. And we're going to use that uh, measure of information. Whenever you see log LR, that's the information content. And so since that's about 10,000, it's got four zeros. The log is a four with something after it. And so that's the order of magnitude, about four information units were extracted from human review. And that was good enough for government work as the case went on. Uh, the individual was convicted and so on. And they were able to get a lot from this major computer, uh, major contributor, a database hit, and so on. Okay. Let's take a look at the data in a different way. And I'd like to introduce for you who haven't seen it before the notion of a quantitative likelihood function when we view the data continuously instead of having uh, thresholds. 
So this is, again, taken from the explain interface of the true allele system, because any good system should be able to tell you, hopefully visually, what it does. In the two orange bars, uh, we're looking at the alleles from the major contributor, 15 and 19. And suppose that's there at an 85% amount. And then in the blue bar uh, at allele 13, so suppose that's a homozygote for a 15% minor contributor. All I've done is I've overlain the amount of DNA that might be at those alleles uh, from the different contributors, orange from the major contributor, blue from the minor contributor. And there's a pattern. This is, this is all taken from one amplification of uh, the base of the gun, number three. Now, when the computer tries that out, it will expand that and create a pattern. And what you're seeing in green, again, as a line, is the original EPG data. It's continuous. There's no thresholds. It's whatever it is, whether it's 100 or 1,000 or 10, that's the data. And in most statistical reasoning, you don't touch the data. You don't do anything to it. The data is what you're conditioning on because you're trying to determine the genetic identity conditioned on the data. Once you change the data, you're determining something, but it may not quite be the genetic identity. Now, in gray, I'm showing those as triangles, or the computer is actually in the explain interface. That's a model that can get created, where you say, all right, suppose that we have this cartoon of what the genotypes would be and how much for this two-person mixture, major and minor. Now, how much, would be, how much DNA would be at each allelic location, how much stutter might be there, how much relative amplification, uh, decay, which isn't being modeled here, wasn't needed in this case. And the question you're asking of a likelihood function, as you know, is how well does your model, your pattern, your prediction, explain the observed data? Well, in this case, you can visually see, and the computer can mathematically see, but there's very little deviation between the peak heights shown with the data in green and the proposed pattern shown in gray. It's very good. If you've chosen different alleles with very different values, you might get no match at all. Uh, so what you're seeing visually is very much what the computer is seeing numerically. And in this case, that would have a high likelihood. Uh, valid statistical inference requires you or a computer to consider every possibility, every combination, if you're a computer in particular, of what the allele pairs would be uh, for each of the two contributors, the different amounts of DNA, the mixing proportions at each experiment, the stutter, the relative amplification, and so on. And so the computer does that, oh, oh, just tries everything out. And when it's done, what's most likely, uh, when combined with priors, ends up being most probable. And so what you get is a probability distribution, which in this case, at every different locus in SGM+, plus, has 100% probability. That is, from the computer's perspective, that was a very easy problem looking at one EPG, one amplification from the base of the handgun. It had a definite genotype at every locus, and the result is it pulled out the full random match probability with the uh, likelihood ratio having an information in its logarithm of 16. And so we see a trillion-fold increase of 10 to the fourth to 10 to the 16th over CPI. Well, that's nice, but we, what also happened in looking at this case is the computer inferred a minor genotype. Uh, it's, and what you're seeing at each locus is a probability distribution. All mixture interpretation methods, when there's uncertainty, produce a probability distribution. But the more the bar is to the right, the more definite it might be about some possibilities over others. You don't get that with inclusion to the same extent as a method, or RMNE. And so we have uncertainty. And when you compare it against profile, you get a log likelihood ratio and information of 5, which is a 100,000-fold increase, uh, which would be good enough to stop, given the person was convicted with just 17,000. Uh, never found the minor person, by the way. So we're going to continue now looking at this minor contributor. I should stress that we don't need to continue with this 
for a criminal case. It's just that we can, and the question scientifically is, how much information can we get out of the data? So let's take a look. Clearly, if we have one swab and we look at both amplifications, you all look at two amplifications from the same item together. The computer does that as well. What it does is it generates, it says suppose, uh, I assume, the computer assumes these particular allele pair values. It tries them out, generates uh, all possible patterns for different variables. It tries out ev every possible allele pair, actually. And it keeps asking, how well does the proposed hypothesis explain the observed data? Because uh, the, the results are conditionally independent on the assumptions, you're allowed to multiply the two likelihood numbers together. We see it as a pattern. The computer sees uh, the likelihood as a number. And it multiplies those together, tries it out for all different genotype possibilities. And it ends up with a little bit more information uh, looking at two amplifications from the one PCR template, we have a little more certainty. And the information content went up to a little over five. And so there was a gain from the human of nothing to under five to over five. Okay. Well, we have four templates. Uh, this is the mixture weight interface from True Allele. It's showing the um, mixture weight probability distribution of the template. Uh, there's, there's separate mixture proportions of each locus, but the template itself is also a variable. We see there are around, you know, this is 15 percent, uh, so what you're looking at is z zero to 100 percent mixture weight, uh, and then this is a scale to show a histogram of saying the probability distribution is around 15 percent for the minor and 85 percent for the major. It's different for each template, as you might imagine. So what we're going to do now is combine, in the interpretation, all the data from items three and four. And now we have a joint likelihood function, where here's the first item and its two amplifications. At locus D18, we can look at the data. And here, for uh, the back of the gun, there are two amplifications. Notice that these two patterns are similar with some peak variation. Those two patterns are similar amongst themselves with peak variation. But the patterns between the two templates are different, which you'd expect. There's a different amount of uh, proportions of how much is, it, is in each of the template of the two contributors. And so the computer tries out all possibilities, sees which um, are more probable. And now, when it infers the minor genotype, you're seeing at every locus, there's an increase in probability towards one particular allele pair. So now we're using two amplifications of two uh, PCR templates. And we end up with a max strength of 10 to the ninth, which is a billion to one or so on. And that's a larger increase as we keep moving along. And so, of course, we'll do it again. And if you look at all four items, and they get interpreted jointly with all duplicate amplifications. Now, when the computer is assessing how well do, does the proposed genotype and the pattern that it produces fit the data, those genotypes and the patterns they produce have to satisfy the constraints of the data from all eight experiments. You see, from, from a probabilistic perspective, all you're trying to do is to get what the genotype is, up to probability, because when there's uncertainty, there's probability, conditioned on the data. The more data you have, the, uh, the more informative your answer might be. Because the way the, the methods work, it's conditionally independent. Each fitting or comparison of the pa a proposed pattern based on a genotype and other variables to the observed data gives a number, that's the likelihood, the probability of observing this particular data uh, given the genotype and dozens of other parameters. And those produce a number, and those eight numbers get multiplied together. The data here are so constraining that, in fact, there's really only one answer that could fit all of that. Uh, and so what you end up with is a unique profile. That's the, 
the genotype. There's only one allele pair possibility now listed at each of the SGM plus loci, and it has 100% probability. Uh, and the result is you achieve the full mass strength of 10 to the 12th, or a trillion to one. And you see in the succession, you're basically done. I mean, I, I think what's the expression? Don't try this at home, right? I mean, you obviously need a detailed mathematical theory and some good calculators to do this. Okay, so these are four PCR templates, two amplifications of each. What I'd like to show you now is the overall trend in information as we adduce more and more data. So the, this is taken from the reporting interface of True Allele. The stuff on the left I just added so it'd be easy to see. Here are the first eight items. They're grouped. This is, these two were from three, uh, four, five, and six. Single amplifications, how much information did we get? We were looking at the top one. We see already that we're getting one of those swabs from True Allele's perspective on the minor contributor giving a max strength of 10 to the eighth, which is 100 million. So again, in the real world, you would have stopped unless you wanted to know the profile exactly. Uh, so we move and we ask jointly what happens when we look at both the amplifications for each template with a joint analysis with two uh, data, two amplifications, three, four, five, and six from the handgun. And we see overall there's an increase in information. That group of four is moving over to the right a little bit. And if you were interested in the most informative one, uh, that's going up to, I don't know, maybe uh, 10 to the ninth. We move over down, actually down one more, and we're asking now, what if we did all the different pairwise combinations of the two templates. If we, again, the orange fourwise combinations are shifting over to the right, and we're going up to uh, 10 to the 10th, uh, 10 to the 11th, until finally we max out uh, with all eight, and we're up to 10 to the 12th. So these are the observations from the study. And then I'll give some conclusions. We looked at co-ancestry, which you can do with the report interface. That cost about half a log unit. It's still around a trillion to one. With three unknown contributors, which we ran through the system, we got essentially the same results. Uh, we see that multiple amplifications can be good if your goal is to get as much information as you can. And multiple templates are even better. Why? <clears throat> it's because the data is what constrains the genotypes. The genotypes are conditioned on data. The more data you have, the more independent, conditionally independent amplifications, the more constraints you have. And so if you're wondering when you do pairwise comparisons, which we're doing studies on, which are good template, which are good amplifications to combine, it's often ones that are dissimilar because the constraints are different. So unlike data, data that's unlike uh, other data, when you put it together, imposes different constraints and more restricts uh, the possibilities of what the genotypes can be. So in conclusion, we looked at two mixture genotype examples. We looked at the major contributor and the minor contributor, and this is what we found. With a major contributor, we saw that there's a quantitative likelihood function, uh, and that model uses all of the data. It doesn't use what some threshold says, well, maybe we should go over 40 or maybe over 50 or some other lab would say 150 as I won't get into the philosophical issue of what is an allele. Let's not go there. Uh, not to, you can ask later. Uh, so quantitative likelihood modeling is when you compare predicted patterns with peak height against the full continuous data that's present and it's more informative than qualitative threshold-based methods. How much more so? Well, we saw we went from the reported 10 to the fourth to 10 to the 16th. So on the major contributor, it was a trillion times more informative. On the minor contributor, we saw that starting with that same one amplification of the item at the base of the gun, number three, we started off with 10 to the fourth. As, as, actually, we started off with zero because there was nothing available on the human review at all. And using a joint likelihood function, which was 
taking products of the quantitative likelihoods over more and more, sorry, over more and more of the data, we eventually found that was also more informative than taking any one particular item in isolation. How much more informative? Well, we went from, again, 10 to the 0 with human review to 10 to the 12th with a unique profile with a joint analysis. So again, about a trillion times more informative than human review. So I guess in conclusion, it's good to use all of your data and you get more information when you do. Thank you.